Has it finally happened? Am I off my rocker? Am I making promises on this channel that I simply cannot keep? Or is it possible to facilitate detoxification, lower inflammation, balance the immune system, and heal from a single molecule? You know me by this point. You know I wouldn't be making this video if there wasn't some truth to this statement. In this video, obviously I'm gonna reveal what the molecule is, where you can find it in food and supplements, how to know if you need more of it, how you can assess it with testing. And of course, we're gonna start with the physiology of what does it do? Why is it so special? Why am I talking about it? Why is it important? And should you actually care about a humble little molecule called glutathione? Starting off the video with the one that feels very apropos this time of year when everybody has New Year's resolutions, let's talk a little bit about detoxification. Acknowledging first that this is not necessarily the same conversation as a lot of those detox and cleanse products you're going to see this time of year. Uh, but we know that detoxification largely happens in the liver. And then probably a lot of you already are aware that there are different phase reactions that the chemicals will go through. So whether it is a prescription medication or a hormone or a toxic chemical or things like mold or mycotoxins, these things that need to get detoxed and excreted out of the body typically will go through a set of, of systems. So it'll go through whatever the chemical might be or the compound will go through phase one detoxification. It gets changed a little bit, but it's not quite ready for excretion. Then it goes through phase two, which is now where the molecule is a lot safer for the body to handle. It's ready to be excreted out of the body. Then it'll go through phase three detoxification, which might be new to some of you, but phase three, what they're calling phase three now, is really just getting it out of the hepatocyte, out of the liver. So it's getting out of that liver cell. And then finally, there's going to be a route for elimination of whatever that compound is. So usually when we're talking about the liver, we think that these compounds, after they've gone through the biotransformation process and they're a little bit safer to handle, then those molecules make their way into the bile, which is also produced in the liver. Then the bile might be concentrated in a gallbladder if you have a gallbladder still. Then the bile is going to be ejected into the small intestine and it's gonna make its way through the intestines. Well, now all of that chemical garbage and the stuff that you worked on in these, these phase one, two, and three detoxification steps, now that stuff has smooth saline out through the exit hatch and out through the rectum in your stool. So that's detoxification in a nutshell. Glutathione is one of the, if not the most important phase two enzyme. So you need this to transform chemical compounds and medications and mycotoxins and get them out of your body. I use a lot of glutathione supplementation, both direct and indirect supplementation, which we'll get to in a minute. I use a lot of supplementation for this when people have been exposed to mold because mycotoxins seem to really deplete you of glutathione. And that's worth mentioning too, is that if you get exposure to a lot of toxic stuff, I'm gonna use that in quotes because Lord knows that that could have many connotations on the internet. But if you get exposed to a high degree of toxicant burden, if there's a lot of chemical burden, so if you're eating, you know, a lot of a lot of foods where it's coming from plastic, or if you're getting exposure to a lot of BPA or phthalates or parabens or a lot of prescription medications or over-the-counter medications or a lot of mold mycotoxins, if you're getting exposed to a lot of stuff that requires detoxification, you're going to start using up the molecules of detoxification and you're going to start using up a lot of their cofactors. So this is where, you know, if you look at the RDA for nutrients, that's going to be the average of what a person might need. But if you have additional burden beyond the average bear, you might need more vitamin B12 or more glutathione or more whatever, simply because you have that much more toxic burden or toxic exposure compared to the average person. So keep that in mind. Uh, I think that trying to gradually reduce our toxic exposure is really worthwhile. And if you have been through a lot, if you've been on a lot of medications or done been around chemicals that you think need to be detoxified, it might be worth supporting glutathione with the information later in that video. But uh, phase two, very, very important. And again, I, I think about this a lot with mold mycotoxins, but also exposure to other chemicals. Um, now, the middle conversation here is actually my favorite part of this entire video, and that is the decreasing of inflammation part of this conversation. Now, 
I've talked about this in other videos, like what happens when we measure inflammation and what we're actually talking about when we say the word inflammation. I would say about 90 or 95% of what we're talking about in this day and age has to do with the immune system and how well it's functioning and how like aggressively it's attacking stuff versus um, there's also this world of like redox, chemical reactions, oxidation, exchanging an electron. Um, that's kind of a separate conversation for the most part. That's where you get into more like bona fide antioxidant stuff where like a molecule of vitamin C could donate an electron and stabilize a molecule again. Glutathione does do that too. But mostly when I think of glutathione for reducing inflammation, I think of it more in the sense of balancing an aberrant immune response. And a lot of people watching this video right now, a lot of folks who visit my channel have some degree of immune inefficiency or inflammation that is driven by an immune response. So I think this is very important to cover. Now, I've, dr I've drawn two seesaws here. Ooh, that was squeakier than I thought it would be. Sorry. Um, I've drawn two seesaws here that I want to talk about. The first one is a balance point between two types of cells in the immune system. So we have T helper 17 and T regulatory cells. These are both T cells. They hang out mostly in the lymph nodes. And what happens is T regulatory cells generally tell the immune system, shh, shh, it's okay, man. You can quiet down. You're cool. I'm cool. We're all cool. We're all happy. We're all cool. There's no threat. You can relax. And that's a nice thing if you're really inflamed or have autoimmune disease, that's a really nice signal to have on board. And a lot of us are lacking that signal. So we can imagine these guys saying, shush, you're okay. TH17 cells, I don't wanna paint them as bad guys because I'm a firm believer that everything in the body, every molecule, every cell has a purpose and it's just trying to do its job the best way it can. But TH17 cells are a bit more aggressive I don't know how I'm going to depict this. I guess I'll draw like a little angry face with like angry eyebrows. Yeah, that'll do. So TH17 cells help you with infections for one. So if you have an infection in a hollow space in particular, like the gut or the sinuses or the lungs, TH17 cells really shine in that environment. Um, they also unfortunately are implicated in nearly every autoimmune disease and cancer. So if you have too many of these cells, or if they are too riled up for too long, they can be really inflammatory and get into a lot of mischief that you otherwise don't want them to get into. So again, they're not bad. It's just that everything in balance and a lot of people are out of balance. So anyway, we have this, this seesaw where it's like, are you turning on the immune system or are you turning it off? Are you turning it on or are you turning it off? Glutathione, works a couple of different ways. I'm going to use a different color here so you can see it clearly. Glutathione directly quiets down Th17 cells and tells them, yo, dude, chill out. You're fine. It also helps to stimulate the T regulatory cells and help them function better. So now we're getting the direct shush, calm down. You're okay. I'm okay. Kind of signal. And between those two things, if you have a, if you have a seesaw, that's this way, right? With TH17 much higher and Tregs suppressed. If you do both of these things that I just said, you're going to start to even out that inflamed seesaw, which is fabulous. Another thing that is worth considering too, is that there are transcription factors and genetic codes and um, proteins that are encoded in all these different cells. Well, one of the chief ones for TH17 cells is NF kappa beta. It's a very inflammatory pathway to a point where it's oftentimes called the master regulator of inflammation. Um, this pathway is how a lot of our favorite anti-inflammatories work, by the way. So things like turmeric, resveratrol, green tea, boswellia, uh, fish oil to a certain extent, and you guessed it, glutathione. So NF-kappa B gets inhibited or turned off by glutathione which again is going to help calm down these TH17 cells among other things. So this is all a very nice net inflammatory response we're already getting at the first seesaw. Now, another seesaw that I wanted to draw your attention to, and some of you might recognize this from my histamine and mast cell videos. If we look here, generally speaking, TH1 cells on this side of the, the seesaw here, 
Th1 cells are good at getting rid of small pathogens. They, they're not good at nuking parasites, but everything else they're pretty good at. So bacteria, fungi, viruses, certainly, um, any of these little critters that a lot of us are dealing with, if you're watching this channel at least, a lot of the little critters that we're coming in contact with all day every day are going to be taken care of by Th1 immunity. Th2 immunity is good at taking care of parasites, which is wonderful, but it also tends to talk to and directly stimulate mast cells. And then of course, mast cells make histamine, which a lot of you are familiar with and not terribly huge fans of at the moment. Um, again, histamine has purpose, mast, cell ha have a, mast cells have a purpose, um, but a lot of you maybe have too many of these things. Also, Th2 cells directly communicate with B cells. B cells make antibodies. So if you've ever had a food allergy test or a food sensitivity test or any sort of test where you have a bunch of antibodies measured against something, and if you have a bunch of those antibodies, like if you get a food sensitivity report and you have like 30 supposed food sensitivities, you can thank your B cells for making the antibodies for that response. And then of course, B cells and mast cells also chit chat back and forth. And both of these communicate back with the Th2 cells too. So it's this whole squirrely web of histamine and mucus and phlegm and not fun stuff. Um, so all of my, my Th2 dominant histamine intolerant mast cell driven folk should really pay attention to this section of the video because what happens oftentimes is that we get this seesaw that goes this way, right? So we have more of this histamine, mucus, hives, kind of allergic kind of presentation. And oftentimes, but not always, our antiviral and antibacterial and antifungal immunity gets squashed down in the process. The seesaw is off kilter here. Well, conveniently, as you might've already guessed based off of this video, glutathione, is very helpful for Th1 immunity and helps boost up that side of the immune system. And in doing so, it can help suppress or quiet down an overactive, overzealous Th2 response. So again, if you're sitting here, right, like here's neutral, if you're sitting here and your seesaw is all out of, out of sorts and you've got all this extra histamine and mast cell stuff and hives and itchiness and eczema and asthma and all of this stuff that we've talked about on this channel, and you take some glutathione, or if you boost some glutathione production in your body, the net result is gonna to be to come back closer to neutral. Um, also of note is that sometimes, as I mentioned here, sometimes what can happen is that people get exposed to some toxic chemical garbage in their environment or their work. That toxic exposure depletes glutathione, and then the lack of glutathione allows the seesaw to start shifting out of place. So every now and then I will see it really clear in somebody's history where maybe they worked at a job where they had to spray chemicals or they had to deal with a lot of chemicals. Um, you know, maybe they lived in a place that had mold and they were exposed to mold for a year or two. But sometimes I'll see this pattern where like somebody was getting exposed to a toxic burden of some sort and then a year or two or three later, they started getting all of these like allergic and quasi allergic conditions popping up and it didn't make any sense. Well, it might've been because they were gradually depleting their glutathione bit by bit. And then it allowed the seesaw to go out of whack. It let the seesaw go out of whack. And then they're left with a bunch of histamine and inflammatory squirreliness that they don't know what to do with. But glutathione might be the corrective measure for that. So for what it's worth. Also of note, stress and stress chemistry like cortisol is another thing that will directly gobble up and lower your glutathione. So similarly, you could go through a really stressful time. And then after that, after that triggering event of the stress, then you bust out with things like eczema or hives or allergic or histamine driven symptoms. In part, I'm not saying this is a hundred percent of it, but in part, that might be because you're depleting glutathione and that lets the seesaw go drift up. And I think like the effects of stress on the human body cannot be underestimated or oversimplified. So I would still want to work on the stress response in that person as well. But this is a piece of it oftentimes. 
Now, last but not least, let's talk briefly about just the idea of healing. Uh, three tissues that I really wanted to highlight in this case that, that do seem to require glutathione or respond very beneficially to glutathione are the nervous system, just broadly speaking, um, central nervous system in particular, so like your brain, spinal cord. There are some really cool videos out there. I think last I knew there was some on Dr. Perlmutter's channel, uh, but there are videos where they give a person with Parkinson's a glutathione IV and they do like before and after videos and the tremors are substantially better. It doesn't last forever. You still have to do a lot of work with those people, but just the idea that you could do an IV of glutathione and get very visible clinical benefit is really, really promising. So your brain, your neurons, um, any sort of nervous system tissue in the body does really well with adequate glutathione, certainly. Uh, also the epithelia of the body, two in particular, I drew, this was my best stab at a blood vessel. Maybe it would be more clear if I drew you a nice red blood cell. There you go. Now it's more clear. So there's a red blood cell. All of these cells that line the blood vessels, so the arteries, the veins, the capillaries, they all need antioxidant protection and glutathione seems to be very helpful in part because it seems to be best friends forever for with another antioxidant system called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide and glutathione seem to be holding each other's hands and BFFs forever in a lot of ways. And nitric oxide is very, very important for the blood vessels. So it might be an indirect thing with blood vessels. I'm not really clear. I'm not a cardiovascular expert, but definitely blood vessels seem to like some degree of glutathione support. And then most importantly for the folks watching this video, probably just based off of my channel and its content, is the gut epithelial lining. So basically we're talking about leaky gut or no leaky gut, right? Um, there are even some papers. I'll see if I can dig them up. It was years and years ago I came across these, so I don't know if I can find them. But there are some papers that even suggested back, I want to say like 2007, 2008-ish range, they even suggested that you cannot develop a leaky gut until you deplete glutathione first, which is wicked cool and wicked profound. Uh, similarly, I also saw research around that same time that suggested that you cannot develop an autoimmune disease until you induce leaky gut and you can't get a leaky gut until you supp suppress glutathione. So probably pretty important for leaky gut, autoimmunity, um, you know, I think that the epithelial lining certainly likes having good glutathione protection, good antioxidant protection. This is the number one most abundant antioxidant in your body, particularly inside the cells. So it, it's important, its importance really can't be overstated here. So glutathione is pretty spectacular. All right, let's pretend that I have utterly convinced you now that this is the coolest molecule ever. You want tons of it. You want more of it. Where can I get it? So let's talk about that because I've got good news for you. You already know the recipe. I mean, like deep in your genetics of your cells, you know the recipe and your body is perfectly capable of making this super cool antioxidant all on its own. You just have to make sure that you have the building blocks. You need to have the ingredients for the recipe to work, right? Well, they're easy enough to come by if you have a well-balanced diet. Now, this humble, humble molecule is only made up of three amino acids. Pretty cool. You have a shopping list of three things, essentially. And glutathione is the junction of all three of these things. The first one I'll mention is glycine. This is probably the single most important reason why everybody and their brother lost their dang minds 10 years ago and started drinking bone broth like it was going out of fashion and doing collagen and collagen peptides out the wazoo. When, you know, the paleo movement kind of got off in like 2012 or 2013 and everybody started doing these things, one of the things that was talked about a lot and a lot of the credit was because of glycine. So very briefly, because this is fascinating, when we in the developed world, so countries like America, eat animal products, we tend to consume things that were the skeletal muscle of that animal. So we eat things like chicken breast and chicken thigh and steak and pork chops. Those were all muscles of the animal, but we tend to throw away or repurpose for like animal food, things like bones, 
connective tissue, organs, um, the, the less desirable parts, you could say. Well, the funny thing is, is that the muscle tissue has a lot of an amino acid called methionine, and it has very, very little, if any, lysine. So we have accidentally created this diet in, in people who do eat meat in developed countries. We have developed this diet that's very high in methionine and almost completely devoid of glycine. Well, again, around 2012, 2013, people started talking about this more and realizing that we can add glycine into our diet and balance the diet back out. So we don't necessarily have to give up all of our meat. We can just add some bone broth and some collagen and add the glycine back into our diet and balance it out and we can get the health benefits. So again, glycine is found in bone broth and collagen predominantly. Um, it's probably found in other like connective tissues and bones and, and that sort of th thing. But honestly, I just, I did not research it for this video. So I don't know, you'll have to Google that. But certainly bone broth and collagen, it's found very abundantly in those foods. So great, great way to get glycine. Also, I will say you can get glycine as a supplement. Um, I usually get the one from Now Foods. It's big old jug, like a pound jug of the stuff. And it's a powder. It's very sweet tasting despite being an amino acid, which you would think would have more of an umami flavor to it. Um, it's very sweet. You can get it as a single ingredient product and it's very easy to take, very well, um, well tolerated, I find. So you could do that too, but I would always opt to get it through food whenever you can first. Um, next up on the list, we have glutamic acid. Now this might ring some bells. If any of you have ever been mindful or like done a diet where you're mindful of MSG, glutamic acid and glutamate, which is in things like MSG, and it's the thing that is implicated in neuroexcitatory conditions and migraines, um, glutamic acid has one additional hydrogen molecule and glutamate just has that hydrogen removed, so it's no longer an acid. So this is basically the same thing. Of note, this can convert to glycine, or I'm sorry, this can convert to glutamine, which everybody knows for like gut healing purposes, like leaky gut kind of support. Um, glutamic acid, glutamate, it's a little hard to find nutritional information on, I found, because a lot of the conversation, especially when you Google it, is around free glutamic acid, which the free floating stuff that's not bound up to a, pro a larger protein is what's really concerning for the neuroexcitatory MSG kind of conversation. So I don't truthfully know of the list I'm about to tell you, I don't know how much of it is bound to protein and how much of it is free glutamate. Um, I wish I could have found that more clearly, but it is what it is. But this is going to be found in things like meat and fish. Again, you're noticing a theme, by the way, like animal products for both. Um, meat and fish have glutamic acid in them. Soybeans do to a certain extent, oddly enough, not so much tofu. When I was researching this and looking at the amount of glutamic acid in foods, tofu was quite a bit lower as opposed to just eating like a, a cup of edamame beans or soybeans. Um, it is also found in a lesser quantity, but still there in things like Parmesan cheese, tomatoes, mushrooms, seaweed, and of course, things like soy sauce and fish sauce. But really the three heavy hitters for this are gonna be meat, fish, and soybeans. Now, I guess you could theoretically get enough from soybeans and like tomatoes and mushrooms if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, but I just don't know. I don't know how common it is to be overtly deficient in glutamic acid, but either way, I don't think it's as important as the thing I'm about to talk about, which is cysteine. So of the three amino acids, even though I'm acknowledging that a lot of people are deficient in glycine, oddly enough, I don't know if your body could find it somewhere else or pull it from another tissue when it needs it. The rate limiter here, the most, the single most important ingredient in this recipe list is cysteine. And the really important thing for you to know about this is that cysteine is a big old sulfur containing amino acid. Now, some of you might be scratching your head why I'm emphasizing this and being dramatic. The reason being is that a lot of people are told by well-intentioned practitioners that they need to cut sulfur out of their diet for the sake of starving hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria, hydrogen sulfide SIBO. And I have been saying for a while, you really don't wanna do that for very long. At the absolute most, when I have somebody 
who has really high levels of hydrogen sulfide producers and they have very severe symptoms, like I'm talking bloody diarrhea, ulcerative colitis level symptoms, occasionally I will have people reduce sulfur in their diet, but I only do so for a week or two at maximum, just long enough to pull them out of a flare and then get it right back in their diet. So be really, really mindful of this. I see this all the time in the SIBO space. People have been on low sulfur diets or eliminating sulfur for months at a time, and that is not sustainable. It's very dangerous, actually. You could be inducing leaky gut, histamine issues, detoxification issues, immune imbalance, all sorts of inflammatory immune stuff. It's, it's so scary that I see this so frequently, and it's becoming more common. Um, but anyway, going back to this, so for those of you who are not on a sulfur-restricted diet, you might be wondering, all right, lady, like, where do we get this in food? This is going to be predominantly found in things like eggs, uh, red meat, such as beef and lamb. To some degree, it's found in chicken and pork as well. Um, you can find a, a bit of it in, again, whole soybeans, not necessarily tofu so much, whole soybeans and whole wheat flour to some degree. Um, and then little piddly amounts in things like, or less, that sounds so rude. Uh, less impressive amounts found in fish and even cottage cheese. So again, there are some more vegetarian and vegan friendly options. You'll notice that there's gonna be a heavy reliance on soy if you are eliminating the meat versions of these, but really the heavy hitters, the biggest ways to get sulfur in your diet tend to be eggs and red meat um, and maybe dairy as a runner up as well. So uh, this is my plea also to people who are vegetarian or vegan. I say I was a vegetarian for 11 years. I changed my diet years ago just because I had to eliminate gluten and dairy. And I found that there was too much restriction. Um, pardon me. There was too much restriction. It just wasn't, it wasn't sustainable to eat like that. So I gave up the one that was simply a preference in order to make room for the restrictions that were medically necessary for me. Uh, but I say this as an 11 year vegetarian and somebody who really didn't want to eat animal protein for a long time, I really do think that animal products are the best ways to get these things. Animal protein is generally speaking easier to digest and it's gonna have much more abundant levels of things like glutamic acid and cysteine and glycine, particularly if you are incorporating some degree of connective tissue or bone broth or collagen into your diet. So just be open-minded to that. I know it maybe not is, is, maybe is something you don't wanna hear right now, um, but that's just from one 11 year vegetarian to potentially another. Um, but really the big one here is the people who are trying to starve SIBO or treat a hydrogen sulfide issue by eliminating sulfur. Please, 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 please find every way to get these things back in your diet ASAP. Otherwise you're going to risk making yourself feel a lot worse. And finally, let's talk about how to test for this or rather how to know if you need more. That's probably the better way to phrase what I'm about to teach you. So let me make myself a head bubble. I'll put myself in the middle and mix it up a little bit. All right, so uh, as veterans of this channel will know, I recently did an experiment where I did not one, but two urine organic acids tests and a nutrient val test with Genova, and I sent them all off on the same day. The plot thickens though, because I also got some blood work done through LabCorp on the same day. It was a very bizarre day. The things I do for you people, my gosh. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look see Lou. So right above my head, you could see number 58 on the organic acids panel, pyroglutamic acid. And you can see that there's an asterisk next to it. That means that a high value for this marker is indicative of a deficiency. And you can see that I look pretty darn good. So if you look at this as a bell curve, um, I am just to the left of the first standard deviation, which is quite a bit better than the average bear, I would say. So you would look at this and assume that I don't need a ton of additional glutathione support based off of whatever I was doing at the time, right? Well, now going to the second one. So again, this is the same urine sample, same day, same person. A uh, little bit of a different story, but not profoundly worse. Um, you know, a little bit of variation here or there, but still, I'm. if you look at that middle line, that black line in the orange box, I'm still to the left of that. So I'm still better than the 50th percentile, right? So again, you wouldn't think that I'm in a great need of glutathione based off of this test. So they, they line up reasonably well. Again, parent, split tests don't have to be 100% identical, keep in mind. Uh, but let's look at LabCorp. 
Uh, so LabCorp is measuring glutathione itself. So this is total glutathione measured in blood. And you can see that I was at 244 on this particular day. And their reference range was 176 to 323. Okay, not not bad, right? I'm not deficient. I'm also not stellar. I'm not at the top. Like I would be much happier if I could get that number up to like 300 or 325, somewhere in that range at the top end of their range. Uh, but I'm also not overtly deficient. So again, you wouldn't look at me and think, gosh, golly gee, you need all the glutathione. So I feel like that mostly lines up. Maybe LabCorp is painting a slightly more grim picture of what my status was at this point. Then we also did this nutri valve, which we talked about in the last video. So again, they look at glutathione in whole blood, and you can see that I'm solidly in the green zone at 1,176. Uh, the reference range is here. So the difference between a deficiency and an insufficiency, so the difference between the red and the yellow would be just shy of 700, so 669. The, uh, the line between yellow and green, so an insufficiency versus sufficient level of that thing, in this case is around 1,000, if I remember correctly from speaking with the lab. Um, so I'm pretty clearly above and beyond that, which is great. Um, again, I feel like we're getting ever so slightly mixed results as far as like the nuanced conversation, right? Like clearly I don't need glutathione urgently, but... LabCorp makes it look like I probably need some support if you want to be like really nitpicky and go above and beyond using the functional ranges. The OAT and Genova suggest otherwise that my glutathione is doing pretty darn good. So maybe slight differences in, uh, in what we're getting here. But overall, I would say at least they're agreeing that I'm not in dire need of glutathione. Now, here's again how the plot thickens a little bit more. What you folks don't know is that I did a nutri eval test last, no, two years ago in 2021, and that told a different story. So if we look, so 1,176 versus 849. Hmm. And I remember being a bit concerned about this and wanting to address it. So I did this test and I worked on some stuff for quite a bit. Uh, you could see over here, I was a bit deficient in folate as well. My fig glue was elevated. Um, but I saw this and realized how important glutathione is, and I decided that I wanted to support it. Um, I will reveal what, because there was really primarily one thing that took my level from 849 up to 1176. I dabbled in a couple of things here or there uh, in that span of time, but really there was one particular supplement that I incorporated into my, my world, and that is the thing that boosted this number. Uh, what I will share, however, is that the nutri eval, one of the claims to fame is that it can give you an idea of a lot of different nutritional markers. So if we scroll, moving my head bubble over a bit, if we scroll down a bit, we've got all of these markers for the amino acids. That's pretty great. And you can see that they're a little bit all over the place. But if we come down here, we have cysteine right here at 10.0, which looks great. Glutamic acid, 7.2, also looks great, right in the middle of the green zone. And then a little bit above my head now, glycine at 10, which is decent. Maybe I could get it up slightly so it's in the middle of that green zone. But overall, the three amino acids look pretty darn good. Now, coming over here, we'll look at the same thing. All right, this is the new nutri -Val. cysteine, looks dece. Glutamic acid, also dece. And glycine, exactly the same, 10. Both of them were 10. So this is a little bit of a head scratcher, right? Because I've got the three amino acids that I need to make the stuff. Uh, I think this is another example where testing, even the functional testing, doesn't tell you the whole truth. And it might not be as infallible and perfect as practitioners and other people would have you believe. Um, so in this case, this new, both of these NutriVal reports made it look like all three of my amino acids were rock solid, right? Just so happens, again, in the category of the things I do for you people, hold on, let me make my head bubble smaller. Um, I have been tracking my 
nutrition in chronometer for about five months because of the ongoing stool test. Particularly, I wanted to track this as I was embarking on the Datis Karazian uh, veggie mashup experiment, which will post probably sometime in February, I think, once I get the next stool test back in. So I've been tracking my nutrition every single day and logging stuff for about five months. So I have this great big report. And of note, let's see, we'll scroll down. Here we go. Uh, you can see protein wise, I do okay. 85% of what my goal was, which is about 100 grams a day. Um, you know, most everything I'm hitting the mark for all of my essentials with the exception of leucine, which is just shy. But you'll notice, oh, sorry, my head bubble's in the way. You'll notice cysteine, not doing so hot, right? Everything else is 100 plus percent, but cysteine is the one that's lagging. And again, keep in mind, this is information from five months of nutritional tracking. So I think this is pretty darn accurate. Um, I would believe this much more than the NutriVal and much more than the other tests for that matter. Because again, I had a iffy glutathione measurement and I brought it up and the one and only supplement that I added into my regime was N-acetylcysteine, NAC, which is a supplement form of cysteine. And it turns out, I found out later that that was the one nutrient in my diet that I was probably lacking and I wasn't getting quite enough of. And look, I, I kind of accidentally proved it too because I supplemented myself with NAC for almost two years. I think it ended up being like a year and nine months or something between NutriVals. I supplemented NAC most days and now the glutathione measurement looks tremendously better. So really cannot stress enough the importance of cysteine in your diet. And keep in mind too, I eat meat, I eat seafood, um, I eat a pretty diverse diet just generally. I eat eggs, I kind of go in phases with eggs where either I'm like super in love with them or I'm not really eating them hardly at all. And I have been in a relatively low egg um, stint with my diet lately. I just haven't been in the mood for them so I haven't forced myself to eat eggs. Um, but maybe I should, I don't know, maybe I should force myself to eat eggs, or maybe I should just wed myself to N-acetylcysteine. But again, I think that it's very telling that five months of nutritional tracking suggested that any or that cysteine was the most efficient thing in my diet for me to work on with regards to glutathione. Then I supplement with N-acetylcysteine for a year, year and a half, redo the measurement, and my markers look way better. And what I will share too, let me bring my head bubble down. Um, I will share also chronometer gives you so much more information. So like we've got fats, we've got carbs, we've got fiber, vitamins, vitamins and minerals out the wazoo. You got your macros. You get so much information. You can see some of the B vitamins could be better. Oh, I'm working on it. Um, you know, we could really, we could, and selenium is okay. I know some of you might be asking about that because selenium is necessary for glutathione form formation as well. Um, you get so much information from something like chronometer. Even if you were to do it for like a week, that would still give you a ton of information. And the pro version of chronometer is like $5.99 a month, as opposed to a NutriVal or an oat test, which are both like $350-400. Or the LabCorp test, just the glutathione measurement alone for the LabCorp draw was like 100 bucks. So would you rather spend upwards of three or $400 trying to sniff out this problem? Or would you rather just do some nutrition tracking, get a ton of additional information out of it, and maybe catch yourself in a cysteine deficiency that you didn't know you had and correct a whole lot of issues? So hashtag not sponsored. Go check out Chronometer. I love it. Um, it's, it's really helpful when I use it with clients and, and students. It's really helpful. Uh, to look at on uh, for my own nutritional sake as well, you might find that you're not getting some of the nutrients that you were otherwise convinced that you were getting. So go forth, track your nutrition just a little bit, report back, let me know. But um, I don't know, my, uh, my truth was that cysteine is queen. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. 
doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.